So uh, welcome everybody, uh, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Bruce Campbell and I'm the director of the Latino Latin American Studies Program at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Um, I've put my email and contact, my email contact information in the chat in case you're interested in our Latino Latin American Studies minor or have questions about our learning community or about the, and or about the mural design project we're organizing for next semester. We're gonna be uh, doing a student-led project, a mural designed on the theme of anti-racism and inclusion. Um, it should be a lot of fun, very interesting. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth and final like to it's all right. I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth and final event in our fall Latino Latin American Studies series exploring race, gender, and power in Latin America. Uh, Latin America's racial systems are different, both historically and in the present, from those of the United States. For example, the territories that are now called the United States were colonized through the physical displacement from the land and isolation of native peoples, while what is now called Latin America was colonized by subjugating native peoples as a cheap labor source for the colonial economy. Where the United States is characterized by a history of white supremacism expressed and embodied through a binary racial system, white versus non-white, Latin America's history of race is marked by the complication of mestizaje, the Spanish term for racial and cultural mixing, and by a complex hierarchy of racial dominance reflected in the colonial casta system and its legacies. This semester's event series has highlighted, highlighted some of the different ways and different contexts in Latin America in which gender and racial identity are negotiated. Tonight, Dr. Ann Twynum offers us a conversation about whiteness and the casta system in Latin America. Audience members can use the Q&A function to pose questions for Dr. Twynum to address during the, the question and answer period following her presentation. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Twynum. Dr. Ann Twynum is professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. She is author of Public Lives, Private Secrets, Gender and Intimacy in Colonial Spanish America, which was published by Stanford University in 1999, and a book which received the Thomas F. McGann Prize and honorable mention for the Bolton Johnson Prize. She more recently has published Purchasing Whiteness, Pardos, Mulatos, and Social Mobility in the Spanish Indies, which was also published by Stanford University in 2015. Welcome, Dr. Twynum, and thank you for sharing your work with us. I will now turn things over to you. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so this is where I put up the PowerPoint, maybe? Uh, so yes, what do I it is. Share screen first. Yeah, share, share screen. Okay, put it up. There we go. Okay, where are you? Oh, oh where are we here? Okay, oh wait, share. Okay, there, we're up now, right? Is it up? I think it's up. Yes, it is. Good. That's good. Okay, we'll do play from start and start from here. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm happy to talk about this really, I think, fascinating topic, which I did actually write a book about. So whatever. But um, to start, I would like today to start uh, considering a president and two kings, all who were contemporaries of each other and all in power in 1795. They were President George Washington in the United States and monarchs George III in England and Charles IV in Spain. So the question I have for you is this, what do you think might have happened if a Pardo or Mulatto, someone of mixed African white ancestry had sent a letter in, in that 1795, say a letter from New York to George Washington or maybe from Kingston to George III, certainly from Havana to Charles IV. And in that letter, they asked their president or their king to permit them to purchase whiteness. What do you think would have been the response of George Washington, Virginian, slaveholder? I don't think so. George III, if you've seen Hamilton, you know he wouldn't have done it either. But Charles IV of Spain, he said, maybe yes. In fact, it was in 1795 that the Spanish crown published a royal decree throughout the Americas that established a price list of purchase, purchasable favors, including the option for pardos and mulattoes, who are known as the castas, to appeal to the Council of the Indies and the King to purchase whiteness. So a first goal of my talk today is to try to answer that fascinating question, 
how could that happen? Now, I must confess that the history behind the purchase of whiteness is something that Latin American historians have literally been trying to research for 100 years. Um, they just couldn't find the documents. Um, so if you want to know how I find them, ask me later. Um, I remember that the first time that I heard about purchasing whiteness was in my undergraduate uh, survey on colonial Latin America that was quite decades ago. In that class, we read Magnus Morner's classic Race Mixture in the History of the Americas, where he discussed the whitening petition of a Caracas pardo named Diego Mejias Bejarano. It turned out that even though the Spanish crown had permitted Diego to purchase whiteness in 1796, he found in 1805 that the University of Caracas still refused to permit his son, Diego Lorenzo, to attend classes, um, then still legally restricted to whites. In a comment that revealed how the concept of whitening remained compelling not only to that past, but to his own present in the 1960s, Magnus Morner had compared this Caracas University to Sandoff to one that had occurred five years before the publication of Race Mixture in 1967. He remembered 1962, when Attorney General Robert Kennedy had called out federal troops, resulting in a violent confrontation that eventually led to the admission of James Meredith and the forced integration of the University of Mississippi, or Old Miss. Wondering if Diego Lorenzo had ever graduated in Caracas, Mourner speculated that, and this, when I do quotes, this is my quoting, I quote a lot, more than words would probably have been needed in the Spanish American Old Miss. So Mourner remained dubious that the University of Caracas would have admitted Pardos, even if officially whitened. Yet decades later, now in 2020, looking back on his comments, what seems striking is that Mourner seems to have missed an even more stunning point. Even while the Spanish crown, Pardos and Mulatos, and Caracas elites had been bitterly arguing over the admission of Diego Lorenzo, they had been doing so openly and peacefully. And they had been doing this in 1805, rather than 157 years later in Mississippi in 1962, or even now with the current issues we face in 2020. So yes, it turns out in striking contrast to Anglo-America in the late 18th and early 19th century Spanish empire, there was a vigorous and sometimes startling debate concerning civil rights policies. Another goal today is, is to explore why such differences. Now, a good place to start is with this decree called the Gracias a Sacar, translated in English permission to take, purchased by Diego Mejias Bejarano from the Spanish crown that granted him whiteness. The number of pardos and mulattoes, and this is sort of the chain of command that you're seeing as it goes up and down, and it eventually goes up to here to the Council of the Indies and the Commer of the Indies, and then it'll go to the king if it worked. Um, the number of pardos and mulattoes who um, applied for whiteness was small. There were just 40 of them, originating mostly from the Circum Caribbean, and you can see that where they're from, um, with, uh, with uh, Colombia, Guatemala, Cuba, Panama, Venezuela, Honduras, Mexico, Argentina, and Peru. Yet these petitions generated thousands of pages of debates concerning the legal discriminations directed against partisan mulattoes. Discussion centered not only whether individual costa should be able to purchase whiteness and what that entailed, but also the larger issue whether institutionalized discriminations against those with African ancestry should cease. Just as key, the history of these whitening petitioners revealed that the mobilities the pardos and mulattoes were seeking formed the tip of a much more important story. Those castes who were able to make it to this borderline where they could request official whiteness had been the beneficiaries of generations of striving of their near and distant ancestors. These arriving as slaves had over the decades and centuries moved from bondage to freedom and from freedom to status as royal vassals accumulating the resulting stature to figure as credible petitioners to the Council of the Indies and the King. So the history of the whitening of Gracias Asakar is thus inextricably linked with the history of three centuries of Pardo and Mulatto struggles for upward mobility in the Spanish Indies. There is of course a strong caveat here, never should the more upbeat history of cost and mobility ever obscure the darker story, the untold thousands who died in slavery or who remained in part of poverty and marginalized. However, it is also vital to understand those processes through which the Spanish empire permitted informal and official mobilities for unknown thousands. It did so in ways that other imperial projects, including that of, Brit of British American colonies or the US Republic simply never envisioned. So I'm going to divide this talk into three sections considering the purchase of whiteness from three perspectives. Why was it possible? How did it happen? And what were the consequences? And I'm going to explore these trends through the history of two brothers from Havana 
Jose Francisco and Manuel Baez, and through already introduced Diego Mejia Bejarano from Caracas. Clearly I'll be covering a lot of territory and I'll only be providing glimpses, but I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. So here's Diego. Um, so a productive place to start is in the middle of the 18th century with two precursor cases that occurred several decades before the 1795 whitening gracias as a car officially appeared. Pardo Jose Francisco Baez, who's down here, applied to the Council of the Indies in 1759 to bypass a law that prohibited members of the Casas from practicing surgery. In 1772, his brother, Manuel, would be the first to seek full whiteness. Um, in their applications, the Baez brothers recounted a family history that had many similarities with other whitening petitioners, as well as unknown thousands of castas. One side started with their grandfather, who's up here, a Spaniard named Don Josef Baez, who was an official on a silver galleon, San Francisco de Assisi, which visited Cuba at the beginning of the 18th century. He had an affair with an unknown Parda woman, let's call her Parda X, and the couple had an illegitimate son named Ignacio. And here we have Ignacio. Witnesses recalled that Don Josef recognized Ignacio, gave him the family name, treated him with love and tenderness. Since Don Josef was traveling back and forth in the galleons, he initially placed his young son to be raised by a white friend in Havana. When Ignacio was seven, Don Josef took him back to Spain for education and the father and son then traveled back and forth between the peninsula and the Americas. Don Josef's paternal influence likely helped the adult Ignacio secure a position as a notary on the frigate San Felipe, which was an occupation legally reserved for whites. In 1722, Ignacio, married um, Havana lady Maria Rafaela Guerrero. She, like Ignacio, was also the illegitimate product of sexual relationships between her single white father and an apartheid mother. So with their marriage, Ignacio and Rafaela eliminated a defect in the next generation, given that their sons, future petitioners, were born legitimate. So the genealogy of the Baez family thus reveals some common strategies promoting custom mobility where sexual relationships between Spanish males and part of females and the subsequent marriage of their illegitimate descendants to each other created lighter appearing and legitimate succeeding generations. But we must not forget part of X up here, but unknown side of the Baez family gender equation. What about part of X, the mother of Ignacio and the grandmother of Jose Francisco and Manuel? Where did she come from? And this is a more complicated story. Since observers commented that her son Ignacio looked white, we can presume that she was both the product of generations of mixing and that some of her ancestors arrived as enslaved Africans. So to understand how the Bias brothers were eventually able to petition the Council of the Indies, it is also important to consider custom mobility. Through what processes did Parta X's African ancestors up here produce this free and almost white grandmother? So to find clues concerning earlier routes of part of mobility, I collected three centuries of Spanish laws concerning slaves and costas and tried to read through them to try to identify places where people had interstices for mobility. And some of what I found was new and some others have discovered. But I concluded that there were key promoters um, that, that led to this mobility. These were Spanish legal traditions, the unique environment of the Americas, time, Catholicism, threats from abroad and costa responses. Chronologically, the 1620s and 30s were a turning point moment for Casta mobility as well. So let's consider how these interstices open avenues for Parta X's ancestors and descendants to achieve mobility. So first, legal traditions. Here it is critical to consider how the 13th century Sieta Partidas and the 16th century laws of Toro facilitated transitions from Pardo to white, from slave to free, and from impoverished to property, all fundamental aspects promoting Casta mobility. Two relevant provisions in the Sieta Partidas concern the concept of naturaleza as well as peninsular understandings concerning the nature of slavery. Okay, so naturaleza is always the most complicated to explain is this really isn't a common angle kind of thing to think this way. Um, the Partidas cryptically defines naturaleza as, and this is a quote, something like nature and that helps it to be and that keeps all descends from it. So it's nature. So nature was sort of the God-given essence that set what a person was. So naturaleza was sort of the flow of that God-given nature thing from as it was inherited from father and mother to offspring. So parents use their naturaleza to pass what, what their internal thing was to their children. 
Positive aspects of naturalization that parents passed to children included nobility or whiteness. But children could also inherit negative uh, uh, natural laces. And these were usually absences, absence of Christianity if a parent was Jewish, absence of legitimacy if the parents were not married and the offspring was illegitimate, absence of whiteness if the parents were a part of a mulatto. These counted as stains or defects. The interchanges in the whitening documents reveal a conceptual plane where everyone agreed that such internal defects in natural laces produced the absence of clean blood or lymphiasis de sangre. This meant a person suffered from inferior quality and was therefore subject to severe legal discriminations. Those with such defects suffered a civil death. They were without honor, unable to hold public offices, attend university, enter professions, be a lawyer, pharmacist, smelter, surgeon, notary, the whole list of them, and most prestigious of all, the priesthood, or it, or it meant a woman could not marry into the elite. Imperial officials, Casas, and in these elites not only agreed that these defects of naturaleza led to this absence of clean blood, meriting discrimination, and this is really important, they also agreed on its mutability. Such internal stains were not necessarily permanent. They could be erased by the monarch, or as one historian nailed it, the king counts more than blood. So understanding the Siete Partidas concept of naturaleza, as well as its alterability, is at the conceptual heart of what made the status transition from Pardo Mulatto to white possible. It reveals that everybody involved agreed that the purchase of whiteness removed an internal defect of naturaleza, in this case, the stain of non-whiteness. However, this process has nothing to do with what me might describe as actual racial change. Someone who purchased whiteness never changed their skin color, obviously. But if the king removed their internal defect of non-whiteness caused by African ancestry, they could henceforth be considered white and enjoy all the privileges of whiteness. The Siete Partidas also established some fundamental parameters in how Spaniards viewed Casas mobility, including the movement to freedom of Parta X's slave ancestors. The Partas, the Partidas did not consider slavery to be an inherent condition, but rather a despised state that the bonded naturally would and should try to alter. The Partida concludes that servitude is the most vile thing in the world, while liberty is the most dear and most esteemed. So while the Partidas did not detail specific legal or administrative paths for slaves to seek emancipation, it did note situations where manumission might occur, including masters freeing slaves through goodwill or for a price. More recently, scholars have noted that while the specific right of a slave to self-purchase, uh, coartacion, did not appear in slave codes, the Partidas combined with popular custom to create a tolerant atmosphere toward manumission that, that, for, that was fundamental for mobility. Probably even more relevant to Parta X's slave ancestors seeking freedom was the Partida definition of how somebody became a slave. <clears throat> Only certain circumstances created the state of bondage, capture in war, um, self-sale, or most pertinent here, birth from the womb of a female slave. Given the impossibility of substantiating paternity at this time, the state of female wombs mattered. The condition of the father was irrelevant. The Partidas agreed that Sons born of a free mother and a slave father will be free. It would be free wombs. Oops, we'll go back. Well, where it's gone nuts now. Let's go back to here. Back to her. Um, let's go. Oh, let's see. Well, sorry. We'll go back and get to it again because we have to get to him. I hit it, I guess. Anyway, it would be free wombs, these free wombs that would open this gaping interstice producing a massive movement from slave to free in Spanish America and the creation of the Society of Castes. It was a historical game changer that historians and scholars are only now beginning to track with some detail. There were there, the presence of millions of free native women and they, Indian women were free and later a free black and Casta females created an extraordinary environment making it possible for slave men to guarantee freedom for their sons and daughters. The musing of 16th century Mexican Viceroy Mar uh, Martin Enriquez provide, possible, pr pr provide powerful evidence that Crown officials recognized that male slaves were using the interstice presented by the Siete Partidas free womb law to emancipate the next generation. He proposed that the Count, this is amazing, he proposed that the Council of Indies eliminate the traditional legal privileges emanating from the free womb. 
Okay, this you won't expect. Instead, he wanted to create the gendered anatomical opposite of a free womb. Now think of what is the gendered anatomical opposite of a free womb. Free, slave, womb, penis. Yes, he wanted to create a slave penis. He suggested that if the father were a slave, then it was the status of his reproductive organ rather than that of the mother that should determine the baby's state. The Council of the Indies ignored him, so this didn't, it didn't work. Not only the Siete Partidas, but also the 16th century laws of Toro were critical in opening up interstices for Pardo access slave and free ancestors. Unlike parts of the US where white fathers could not marry non-white partners and leave and therefore leave property to their mixed blood children, Spanish inheritance law was colorblind. While the laws of Taro did discriminate against requests to people who are illegitimate, it made no distinction as to the slave, free, white, mulatto, or black status of the bequeather or the inheritor. In Spanish America, unlike Anglo-America, a person's social racial status had no impact on his ability to inherit or to pass wealth to succeeding generations. So we know how important that was. Catholicism proved another key variable that promoted the mobility of part of X's ancestors. A series of laws demanded that masters convert all slaves to Catholicism, ordering them to send Africans daily to mass to priests until they learn Christian doctrine. It remains difficult to determine the extent, of course, to which masters obeyed such orders, and it is equally evident that the newly arrived and their descendants maintained significant elephant elements of African practice. Yet time really does begin to matter here. Compared to mainland North America, slavery, slavery arrived early in the Spanish Indies. Statistics from the transatlantic slave trade reveal that by 1650, more than a quarter of million slaves had survived the Middle Passage and landed in the Spanish Caribbean, Mexico, and Peru. That's a quarter of a million compared to only 141 who had arrived by 1650 in British America. As generation after generation had passed in the Spanish Indies, first slave and then free Costa populations had increasingly identified themselves as Catholics. And the imperial officials and their, and their neighbors also recognized them as part of a national Spanish Catholic us. After a, a more than a century after the conquest where the pr pr predominant comments of imperial officials were to condemn the growth of po Costa populations or to attempt to chastise control or tax them, the 1620s and 30s marked a notable change in the tone of imperial legislation and a major turning point. Both longevity and vulnerability underlay this trans transformation. By the 1620s, there were Costas who descended from multiple generations of free, freeborn who were Catholic and who was determined as their neighbors to defend their homeland against foreign incursions. As the empire became increasingly precarious, both from the massive, oops, this thing keeps doing that, massive depopulation. Oh, we go again. Sorry, I guess when I, that thing hits it, it hits it. I don't know, whatever. There we go, we'll get back to them. I'll move it here. The massive depopulation of native population, um, um, as well as foreign attacks, um, officials began to realize that the Casas might figure as numerous and loyal supporters. Some of the first positive comments originated from Mexico in 1621. Part of militia units from Puebla traveled to Veracruz to help defend the port. In 1625, imperial officials praised the free blacks of Panama who had helped in the building of trenches, acted as sentries, and given help to the other soldiers. In 1627, when the Dutch attacked Lima's port of Callao, companies of mulattoes and pardos fought to repel the invader. Officials subsequently praised the free blacks who well and punctually followed the orders given them. As a cohort of scholars have traced, militia service proved to be a major turning point in how the monarchy viewed pardos and mulattoes and how they viewed themselves. As Herbert Klein noted years ago, it represented the basic right of citizens to defend their state. Or as David Sartorius recently observed, militia service permitted Pardos to be included as subjects of the empire. That certainly wasn't occurring elsewhere. As the Costas founded Pardo guilds that helped fund them military units, as they successfully petitioned to be commanded by their own rather than by white officers, as decades of service made those officers particularly eligible for royal favor, the Costas began to move from the status of problematic freedmen to that of recognized vassals of the king. Once the crown transitioned free pardos, blacks, and mulattoes from the unwelcome category of inconveniences to the desired one of vassals, the mutual responsibilities of reciprocity took hold. 
as Alexander Konecki has explored, it became the duty of the monarch to reward those services rendered by his vassals, giving to each one according to his merits. Most key, those who provided service to the state married, married serious attention when they petitioned as well as meaningful rewards. This royal recognition of partisan mulattoes as vassals was crucial. It provides an answer to that fundamental question as to why in the mid 18th century, when cost is applied for partial or for full whiteness, the Council of the Indies, even if ministers refused their petitions, they still analyzed them and they considered them seriously and they forwarded their petitions to the king. So now that we've tracked how the Siete Partidas, the laws of Tarl, the presence of free wombs, time Catholicism, foreign threats, and Costa responses might have facilitated the transition of Parta X's ancestors from slave to free and from free to vassal, let us return to her grandsons, Jose Francisco and Manuel, and the second topic, which is the origins of the white and gracias a Sacar. So how did it happen? When in 1759, Jose Francisco Baez petitioned the Council of the Indies to practice the prohibited profession of surgeon, since he was a pardo, his request was consistent with historic Costa mobility strategies of detaching the defect, uh, detaching the defect of partiness and trying to attach whiteness. In Jose Francisco's case, another crisis of empire, the Seven Years' War, helped, given that he possessed the needed expertise. Although he had apprenticed and practiced as a surgeon for 13 years, he asked for a royal decree dispensing the point of limpieza, or that clean blood, so the medical establishment would lack any pretense to forbid his surgical practice. The response of Crown Attorney Tomas de Maldonado reveals how royal officials contributed to the creation of the whitening gracias a Sacar. Maldonado fully supported Jose Francisco's petition to practice surgery, nor did he charge him. Yet the language of the ensuing royal decree took this occupational exemption a step closer to full whiteness. It echoed the language of the Siete Partidas, for it erased the defect that you suffer from birth and leave you able and capable as if you did not have it, repealing this time in your favor whatever laws, ordinances, or constitutions speak otherwise. Jose Francisco's success led to further applications starting in the 1760s. Costa surgeons from Cuba, as well as Pardo notaries from Panama applied for exemptions to attach sufficient whiteness to practice these prohibited uh, professions. It was when the Crown attorneys evaluated the Panama petitions that they took the next step. They commoditized the purchase of whiteness. Officials proposed the petitioners should not only pay what was a traditional fee to acquire the title of notary, but they should also pay another price to eliminate their status as Pardos. These sums would later be those charged in the 1795 Gracias a Sakar. The occupational exemptions for Casas and the commoditation of whiteness opened a pathway to the next step taken by Jose Francisco's brother, Manuel. In 1772, he applied to attach full whiteness. He provided royal officials with a laundry list of Hispanic Pardo aspirations. Whiteness not for any occupational purpose, but for itself alone. The transfer of whiteness to succeeding generations, marriages with whites, the elimination of discriminations, including admission to the university, entrance to forbidden occupations, including the priesthood, access to public offices. Manuel not only recounted the family history, but provided details concerning his own loyalty and bravery during the British siege of Havana in 1762. He had distributed fresh pork for the hospitals and the rest of the townspeople and carried beef fat to the bulwarks and forts to grease the cannons to fire. He carried out such duties with danger and evident risk of life and without salary or stipend. He also attempted to leverage precedent suggesting he had the same good qualities as his brother. So Manuel's petition was doomed. Um, neither he nor later petitioners from Guatemala and Venezuela would enjoy full whitening by the Council of the Indies before 1795. Yet even as they failed, the very process of reviewing of such applications began to shift royal response. While the Crown Attorney had described Manuel's application as strange, in later years, officials would be more sympathetic. In one case, issuing a letter in favor of a Venezuelan parda, suggesting she should not suffer discrimination. More key, these 1795 petitions would become precedents. In the early 1790s, officials in general accounting ordering, ordered to update a list of gracias a Sakar favors had begun to rummage through the archives at the Council of the Indies. They would find the exemptions for surgeons, the sums charged to end the defect of pardo notaries, the unsuccessful petitions for full whiteness. In their preface to the 1795 Gracias a Sacar, they would explain they based it on a 1773 counterpart for Spain, but also on what they had discovered concerning Indies practice. 
Officials would then add a last section of favors unique to the Indies. In a radical extension of existing practice, given that the Commer had only until their approved occupational whitenings, Conoderia officials would provide the option for pardos to purchase full whiteness. They would tack the relevant clauses almost as an afterthought at the end of the price lists, which the Council of the Indies would issue on February 10th, 1795. This was a breathtaking change. Understanding this process of creation leads to an intriguing conclusion. The whitening gracias a Sakar originated not from any rational or considered crown policy to better the status of Costas. Rather, it was the product of part of petitions, bourbon codification, and bureaucratic housekeeping. It was precisely because of this less than deliberative origin that the Council of the Andes would struggle after 1795 to develop coherent policy, not only concerning the whitening of individuals, but the status of the Costas, which is the third topic under consideration. So let's see if I can do another slide. Okay. So it's now time to return down here to Diego Mejia Speyerano. He's here. Um, that successful recipient of a whitening degree in um, July 1796, and that he was the, that concerned father who is trying to enroll his son, this is Diego Lorenzo, that son that he was trying to enroll him in the University of Caracas in 1805. So a quick look at his family genealogy re reveals how his clan had and had not followed typical mobility, uh, part of mobility pathways, and let us consider some of them. Time. Um, you look, the, the generations here, Diego's ancestors were um, demonstrably more than three generations from slavery. The militias, there's a whole bunch of these guys, uh, Antonio, Jose, and Basilio, and Francisco, there's a whole bunch of these guys here, had served for years as officers in the part of militias as, and a captain, their militia units. The, can, the clan belonged to the Catholic us as they were generous contributors to their parish church of Alta Gracia in Caracas. The reason that Diego Lorenzo here wanted a university degree was to enter the priesthood and to hold a chaplaincy that had been founded by his aunt. The family also evidenced their respectability through generations of marriages and legitimate births. The family passed well through the generations. Diego here owned numerous houses and figured among the most prosperous parts in Caracas. He was a surgeon, um, like uh, the Cuban, but he had not had to apply to the Council of the Indies because the Crown now permitted Casas to apply locally for such exemptions. Where this clan was less typical was their pattern of intermarriage among themselves rather than whitening as the Bais had done through marriages with brides and grooms with white fathers. Diego, for example, and this is a really complicated genealogy here, but he was a first cousin married to a first cousin. The climate in Caracas was not propitious for mixing. Local elites were without a question the most hostile group in the Americas toward Costa mobility. To anticipate, Diego would suffer the most discrimination of all the whitening petitioners. Nor does it appear, unless, that Diego Lorenzo ever entered the university, although others who received the whitening grassy sasacar from Colombia and Peru would graduate. There would be literally, and this is literally true, tens of pounds of documents protesting whitening emanating from Venezuela compared to less than an ounce from the rest of everybody else in the Indies. So that's how much they were against it. So why was Caracas the center of this perfect storm of protest? There was substantial part of presence. Half the, almost half the population of 800,000 were free costas and some like Diego had enjoyed significant mobility. In response, local elites engaged in preemptive and aggressive measures using their control of the city council to maintain hierarchy. Even prior to 1795, when the Caracas Cabildo had some hints of these precursor applications, they had engaged in a preemptive strike sending two long reports to King Charles uh, IV protesting Pardo arrogance and denouncing any potential for their mobility. They followed with additional letters in 1796 and 98 denouncing whitening. In 1803, the Cabildo, the Bishop in the university directed voluminous protests to the Council of the Indies concerning the whitening of Diego Mejia Bejarano and the potential admission of Diego Lorenzo to the university to study for the priesthood. As the Bishop concluded, there are no mulattoes capable of the sanctuary. Yet that same December 1803 that the Council of the Indies received these letters condemning the whitening of Diego, they read a strikingly different interpretation of events from Miguel de Guevara Vasconcelos, the governor of Caracas. He began with a blunt comment. In the multitude of very grave affairs that have occurred in the almost five years that I have governed these provinces, none is more delicate nor ought to be more considered than that which involves the case of Diego Mejia Bejarano. 
On one hand, he sided with the Caracas elite, for he feared if the dispensation of Calidad of Mulatos becomes widespread, it would not be long before the political order would be confused and disordered. However, he cautioned that denying the Costas all hope of advancement and estimation carries with it equally disastrous consequences. He worried that failure to promote part of mobility would weaken thoughts of faithfulness and attention to royal service in those who were indispensable to count on for the conservation of these kingdoms. Those galleons carrying the governors and the Caracas elites letters of protest eastward in 1803 also carried pleas from Diego Mejias. Diego confessed that his son's unexpected rejection had been a shameful humiliation, given Diego Lorenzo's honest and intense goal to enter the priesthood. He admitted that his only remedy was to throw himself again at the feet of your majesty and ask for an order that permitted his son to take the qualifying examination and enter the university. So what were the consequences of these protests? How did they affect other applications for whiteness? And one way to track later developments is to explore how Diego's problems became linked to Council of Indies proposed policies in 1808 and 1806 concerning whitening and the civil rights of the Costas, and then how these themes found even later resonance in the Cortes of Condes in 1812. So let's, let's do it. On one issue, Council of the Indies officials never faltered. In 1805, they sided with Diego and engaged in affirmative action. Ministers hurled stunning blows of condemnations against the Caracas's established op opposition to whitening, and they demanded obedience to royal orders. The letter to imperial officials concluded, there has been no just motive not to observe and fulfill the favor conceded. The decree to the University of Caracas ordered faculty to permit Diego Lorenzo to take the Latin exam, and if he passed to admit him right away without excuse. It was not sufficient that he attend classes. He should not suffer discrimination. Faculty should treat him with love and attention as the other students, and he should not be humiliated or insulted due to his different color. However, reading the internal scribbles, scribbles on Council of the Indies documents reveals that while ministers were adamant that whitening decrees once issued should be obeyed, they became more conflicted about granting them. As the Council of the Indies struggled to figure out whitening policy, there was an unexpected intervention that would have significant consequences. In 1802, Guatemalan Jose Antonio Goquechea, a provincial of the Franciscan order, had sent a letter to powerful Don Jose Antonio Caballero, the Secretary of State. Provincial Goycachea, I love this comment. Provincial Goycachea confided that he had no temptation to ask for favors for himself since he was touching 70 years and on the edge of his tomb. Rather, he pleaded for the Costas. Goycachea provided a detailed account of a discriminatory, lands a discriminatory landscape in Guatemala that bore striking resemblances to Venezuela. Elites considered mulattoes to be vile and despicable, even though they had the most excellent talents, den denying them entry to the priesthood monasteries and the university. Notably, the Franciscan provided a more contemporary, closer to a mo modern racist interpretation as to why the Costas suffered such despised status. Unlike royal officials and elites who constantly affirm that the inferior status of the Costas derived from that internal defect of natural lace up, he concluded, in the greatest part, color here decides worth. Goycachea movingly described the pernicious effects of such discrimination on two young Pardo acquaintances. Benito Science was a stupendous organist who wanted to take religious vows but faced rejection um, given the presumed infamy to see a mulatto at the altars. Jose Man Maria Cabrejo had found that after three years of university study, a secret inquiry into his antecedents denied him graduation. It was in response to the latter's bitterness that the Franciscan promised to him to make a petition to your majesty speaking in his favor. While Goycachea hoped to advance the careers of his two young protégés, he did not request their whitening. Rather, he proposed a more radical and sweeping transformation. The king should issue a decree that permitted paros and mulattoes to contract marriage with Spanish people of common nobility, to be eligible to obtain degrees in the Royal University and to be admitted to the clergy and religious communities. There must have been support for such change since the Secretary of State, Caballero, ordered the Council of the Indies to evaluate and report on Goicochea's recommendations. The Council of the Indies was in no hurry. Ministers procrastinated for more than a year, sending the Franciscans document ping-ponging back and forth between their offices. Finally, in late 1804, internal scribbling in the files revealed that the Secretary for Peru made a provocative move. He combined this huge file that had been coming from Diego Mejias Bejarano with the Goicochea correspondence and with the Secretary of State's order to rethink Costa policies. 
analysis of these combined documents would produce the 1806 and 1808 consultas that considered both the future of the whitening grass de Sassacar and the potential enhanced mobility for Costas. And so we come to what I call the 1806 mystery consulta because we don't know who wrote it. The only copy is a copy, not the original document that went through the bureaucracy of the Council of the Indies. Uh, so the unknown minister who wrote it, I'm calling him Minister X, reviewed all of this correspondence. Um, so although the minister ordered that the, uh, and, 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 and wrote this consulta, so although the minister ordered that the Caracas establishment had to accept the consequences of the whitening of Diego, including the admission of Diego Lorenzo to the university, he empathized with the elite's complaints. He agreed that inconveniences and private prejudice might arise if Pardos became spoiled and proud. Even so, Minister X insisted that humanity and religion demanded that Pardos receive respectful treatment as vassals and as men, even while the state maintained caste distinctions. His goal was to find balance within the overall system so that a certain justice should not be lacking. The minister also referenced the proposal by Friar Gaikachea concerning the, that the monarch equal the status of the castes to the common class of Spaniards. He concluded that the Franciscan had made a manifest mistake when he had suggested that it was intolerance due to color that led to the degraded status of the castes. Rather, the unknown minister attributed their inferior state to law, for it institutionalized discrimination against them and led to the miserable state of contempt that they suffer. He then raised a very provocative question. If the logical inference was that unequal legal treatment had produced the sad condition of partisan mulattoes, should the state consider a remedy? His answer was yes. Minister X concluded that there was need for a recalibration of reciprocity between the monarch and castes. He declared if partisan mulattoes were destitute of all hope to better their fate and to include themselves in the general sphere of the other vassals, they would become discouraged and naturally fall into their natural disorders and bad inclinations. So what was his solution? His first policy suggestions were not surprising. He fully supported whitening and recommended that Costas continue to be able to petition the king through Gracias a Sakar. He then proposed a startling change of policy. He suggested that those Costas who could prove that they could trace free and legitimate descent in four generations would be eligible for every office and post held by the common people of Spain. What the anonymous minister proposed was a multi-generational variant of a womb policy. Costas who could document four generations of birth from free married wombs would have the privileges of whites, at least of whites who are plebeians. While it might take the majority multiple generations to move toward whiteness, Minister X had to know that there were families like Diego's who met or were very close to those standards. Equally notable was Minister X continued rejection of color as a defining variable in any movement toward white status. Instead, he privileged the number of generations from slavery and legitimacy as the key markers. Also significant was his assumption that no inherent deficiency prevented the castes from achieving equality. So what happened to the 1806 consulta? Well, the Council of the Indies mostly ignored it. While ministers agreed on the need for a revised policy, they insisted that no decisions could occur, could occur until they heard from general accounting concerning the impact on revenue. For if the costas were become white, they would no longer pay tribute. So everything was put on hold, including decisions concerning whitening until the officials heard from the money men. So in January, 1808, Minister Vienna, who's the head of general accounting, finally presented his long awaited policy recommendations to the Council of the Indies. His consulta considered three controversial issues that dominated the history of the whitening gracias a Sakar, the objections of the Venezuelan establishment, the absence of guidelines in awarding and specifying the consequences of whitening and the perspective for a policy granting general mobility to the Costas. Not surprisingly, officials in general accounting had no consideration for Venezuelan elites who disobeyed royal orders. They ordered them again to obey. The 1808 consulta supported the whitening gracias a Sakar and declared that it should be absolute, overcoming any discrimination, providing full whiteness. However, officials limited such benefits to the individual, for they felt there would be incalculable prejudice to royal revenues if such exemptions descended down the generations through families. Finally, the, the report considered the prospect of supporting general cost of mobility. And officials concluded because of various political reasons, it might not be convenient to equal everybody to the whites. Yet they recognized that the issue was larger than simply financial and that there would be dismal consequences, as they said, if they did not reward 
people who can not only be as useful as the whites in whatever profession that they dedicate themselves to, but who are absolutely necessary for the preservation and fostering of these kingdoms. The report concluded that it would not be just due only to their accidental color to discriminate against the Costas. Minister Viana recommended the establishment of a two-part mobility system. Those who performed extraordinary service could get the gracias a sacar and become fully white. And then others would get special privileges, but maybe not be totally white. He concluded that the Council of the Indies would have to consult on such a delicate matter to decide what was convenient. So what happened? Napoleon happened. The month after the 1808 consulta appeared, French troops had already begun to move into Spanish territory. By May, Bonaparte would force the resignation of Charles IV, exile his heir, Ferdinand to Bayonne, and place his own brother, Justice Joseph, on the Spanish throne. Local hunters would form, joining um, into a supreme junta and eventually into a council of regency to govern the empire and to direct the war against the French. The debate over the future of Costa mobility would shift from the Council of the Indies to the delegates of the Cortes of Cadiz, tasked with writing a constitution for the empire. One day was instantly historic. On September 24, 1810, for the first time in more than 300 years, elected representatives from the peninsula, the peninsulares, and the Americas would face each other in the Cortes and begin to debate the future of their empire. Included among the most controversial topics was the status of partisan mulattoes. The reason was simple. If the Casas became citizens, along with whites and natives, the Americas would have more representatives in the Cortes than Spain. Embedded either directly or implicitly in every debate between Spaniards and Americans were these issues of relative power. In the early months of the Cortes, the American delegates essentially sold the castas out, trading guarantees of equality between Spain and the Indies and assured citizenship for themselves and natives and leaving the castas in an ambiguous state. However, as the independence movements took hold in the mainland and as more elected delegates actually arrived from the Americas, the tone shifted. As the Cortes debated the articles of the Constitution of 1812, Peruvian, Mexican, and Central American delegates fought passionately for equality for partos and mulatos, even though they knew they were outnumbered and almost certain to fail. They manifested their deep knowledge of and support for those processes that promoted Costa upward mobility and that had shaped their own communities. Zacatecas delegate Jose Miguel Gordoa asked how the Constitution could exclude Costa citizenship when they had passed 20 or more generations in the Indies. Fox Collin, Greedy, y Alcacer provided a list that would have been familiar to royal officials and to whitening petitioners as to why partisan mulattoes merited the right of citizenship. They deserved inclusion due to birth, vassalage, upbringing, service in arms, marriage, inheritance, residence, as well as shared Catholicism. Given the American delegates were outnumbered in 1812, they failed in that Article 22 to not automatically make the cost of citizens. It established a gracias a sacar like process for them to apply and if they prove their worth to, refre to receive full citizenship without payment. Yet while the Peninsulares and Americans disagreed on many issues concerning the castas, in the end, they had agreed on one thing. Partisan mulattoes should not suffer the discriminations of the past. In those debates, Mexican delegate Ramos Arzipe had rallied against those barbarous laws that had closed the doors of the colegios and universities, that had forbidden partisan mulattoes to enter houses of education and even religious communities of both sexes. He considered such discrimination to be an unheard of scandal that might exist only in barbarous centuries, but not continue in the present. Costa Rican delegate Castillo recalled personal memories of the pernicious effect of such prejudice remembering various use that had wanted to pursue an education, but had to abandon their efforts and they remain as mutilated plants without bearing fruit. Not just Americans, but even those Spanish delegates such as Catalan representative Jaime Cris agreed, one ought not to deprive them of education. In this, the Cortes of Cadiz debates confirm the opinions of the 1806 and 1808 consultas that the state should enact measures enhancing the mobility of the Costas. And so even before the constitution of 1812 was finished, the Cortes of Cadiz responded on January 1st, 1812, to that rare peninsular and American consensus that the Costas should no longer suffer certain of the discriminations of the past. It declared that the Cortes's goal was 
to facilitate for those Spanish subjects who through whatever line carry their origin from Africa, the study of the sciences and access to ecclesiastical careers. In the future, they should be admitted to graduation and the degrees of the universities, to be students of the seminaries, to take the habit in religious communities and to receive holy orders. So my final hope is that you now understand why in 1812, it seemed a plausible next step for a Spanish parliament to permit partisan mulattoes to enter the university and to graduate from universities when we all know it would have been inconceivable for a US Congress in 1812 to entertain such a transformation. So hopefully you now have some idea maybe why there was that difference. So thank you. Fascinating. <clears throat> um, so I would invite people to uh, share questions that you might have uh, through the Q&A function um, <clears throat> so that Dr. Twynham can respond to those. <clears throat> um, I think the comparison is, is a really interesting way to think about that uh, for many of us who are less familiar with the history of racial systems outside the United States. <clears throat> um, the history of race in the United States sometimes feels like the history of race, right? Um, so very, very useful uh, contrast and comparison. Um, so we have a, a question in the Q&A for you. The first question is, um, given your assertion that caste marks the historical difference between North America and Hispanic American treatment of race, in your opinion, how valid is Il Isabel Wilkerson's use of the term caste in the origins of our discontents to describe the black slavery system in North America? Yeah, I mean, I... I, I think it has very, very different um, uh, uh, interpretations, um, very different definitions. I mean, I, I, one of the things that I'm really careful when I'm doing all of this work is, is to try to understand what people at the time were thinking and how they were describing it. I was using an emic methodology to listen to them, not to take, to borrow. And so I you always have been very careful to use their words and, and what they say and what they mean. And it can, it can be very different, like things like naturaleza or, or caste. I mean, we have to remember, I mean, it's not that this is not, not uh, everybody, I mean, the difference was in Spanish America, part of the is rather than saying, we wanna be equal with whites, they said, we wanna be whites. They had a different way of of, of uh, doing it. They 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 agreed that whiteness was superior. They weren't they they didn't challenge that. What they wanted to say was that there's another way for us to have upper mobility. Just make us white. <clears throat> I'm I'm curious as a follow up to that <clears throat> if you could. Um, so in your in your presentation and uh, your book the focus is on pardos and, and mulatos, right? Um, but the, the casta system in Latin America included uh, numerous other categories, right? I don't remember even half of them, but I know there's like Lobo and <clears throat> Mestizo, obviously. <clears throat> um, uh, something like 16, is, is that correct? Um, well, that's what the casta paintings sort of show, it, but that's... that's the elites mm -hmm. manufacturing that in the 18th century. Yeah. They, there were lots of terms and different places had different, you know, different, uh, you know, different use of Peruvians had different words to describe it than the Mexicans did and, and stuff. They, they, those words did sort of, did sort of vary um, uh, depending upon, uh, but uh, so, so that, that would be the, the difference. But the, but the Gracias a Sacar was, was one that specifically Afro-descendant uh, people <laughs> Use. That's that's sort of where I wanted to see if there was some additional yeah. detail with the various other casta positions. Yeah, the gracias of the car has only two categories well, uh, for this purchase of whiteness. One is um, um, a pardos, and one is um, uh, 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 quinterones, or those who are one fifth. Um, uh, the difference is that if you didn't have any African ancestry, you had limpia de sangre. Um, you were not considered so 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 that's one thing. Uh, so so that was why natives didn't have to buy whiteness because they were considered white. They they were considered to have limpia de sangre. Mestizos were considered to have limpia de sangre. The only ones who were eliminated were those who were Africans because the you know, and, and there's a whole Martinez at the whole a book on that how they how um, uh, the idea was that Africans had known about Catholicism and rejected it while the Indians hadn't. So they 
had Olympia City Sign. They had Olympia City Sign Bridge. So that's one thing. One of the things about Casas that I was very aware of was that, for example, in all these literally thousands of pages of debates on the um, in 1812 in the Cortes of Cadiz, they always used the word Casta, and they meant part. They meant African, those of African descent. The people at the time, the elites were who were arguing it meant they never were talking about nat natives were something else. It was the castas were considered those of African ancestry. And so we do talk about castas, but um, people at the time, uh, I, it's certainly by 1812, and I think before also um, had more more limited casta to um, uh, paras and mulattoes than and those of African ancestry than natives. Interesting. <clears throat> um. Uh, another question, what does gracias a sacar mean? Oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, the first time I ran across it, I was like, thanks to take. If you know Spanish, that's what it, it <laughs> seemed. And I, in, in my book, um, uh, I have this wonderful paragraph where I, I list, because I, I used Google and I was able to find this, like 20 ways in which people have translated gracias a sacar. And some of them are utterly hysterically funny because they it, no, it's really hard to, to translate it. I ended up translating it basically as um, permission to take is what I really think it means. It's what it means is it's permission. To, it's permission for someone to take themselves from one status to another. So the king gives you a permission to take. So it gives you permission if you're because if, gracias a sacar was other things as well. So if you were illegitimate, you could get one of these royal decrees that made you legitimate. If you are a plebeian, you could get one of these royal decrees that could make you a noble. Or if you were a pardo, you could get a royal decree that made you white. So it you permission to take yourself from one status that you had to move to another status. And I think that's the the better way to translate it. But there are some hilarious ones. I, permission to pick myself up and they're just the really funny ones. Another question. <clears throat> Did the idea of being able to purchase whiteness through distinctive service persist after the revolutionary period? Could a descendant of slaves purchase whiteness through, say, service to a revolutionary regime? Um, well, they didn't have to because they freed the slaves pretty fast. Uh, so that it wasn't much of an, much of an issue. I mean, it, 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 in Brazil, that was different. But in Spanish America, there, um, there was, if you fought in the revolutionary armies, you were given your freedom anyway. But um, pretty quickly afterwards, um, either by one generation, but even earlier than that, depending on the country, uh, slavery was over. So it wasn't uh, an issue. Uh, another question. <clears throat> How many whitening petitions did you find? How representative were the petitioners of the Pardo pop population? And what was the cost for obtaining a Gracias al Sacar as codified in 1795? Oh, that's great. Yeah, um, I, found, I didn't find very many and I found about 40 of them. And um, uh, when I was in the other, the book I wrote before was also based on Gracias a Sacar for Legitimations. I had 224 of those. So this was not used very much, but I think it was not used very much because it was new. Um, I mean, it was, it was first introduced in, in the 1795 um, uh, uh, RNCL, this price list, while something like legitimations had been going on for centuries. So people knew about them and they would apply. So it was a new thing. I think also that it wasn't, probably published very well because it was published in this 1795 price list which mostly elites knew about and I get the you know and so if if it were published it might have gone to a town and the town crier might have said, read it once and I get the feeling one of the reasons why not many people applied was because um, they didn't know about it now um, uh, so so that might have been another of the reasons why there weren't so many. What was important to me was that I began to realize that these 40 were at the very peak of this mountain of this, all these other things that I was talking about. So even though there were only maybe 40 officially applying for whiteness, there were thousands who were getting something of, of this upward mobility, um, you know, uh, and, and enjoying uh, things like, you know, bypassing the discriminations. Um, these were the, the, the ones at the very top. Um, you had a, a bunch where there were some uh, that were granted, for example, you also would sometimes have um, 
um, like one one guy applied for two wives. He 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 married one part of a woman and he whitened her. And then after she died, he married another of the, her relatives and he whitened her too. So he knew all about it. He was a royal official and he um, so so women were being whitened uh, uh, as well. Another I question. Else I didn't answer. <clears throat> by, I, by a follow up question, uh, which you may have just addressed, was what was the cost of purchasing the privileges? Oh, it was really inexpensive. And this is this was very funny because when you look at the historiography of the hundred, there is a hundred years of historiography on this from 1918 to you know, when my book comes out, um, uh, there is, uh, historians had this hilarious thing because they didn't know, they didn't, they, they kept saying, oh, it was really expensive and others for Pardos, it would be way too expensive for them. And then others were saying, oh no, it was so inexpensive, anybody could do it. And they were, others were saying, oh, the crown never gave it. And others were saying, oh, anybody who applied got it. They had made this stuff up because they gotten so far from the sources and, and so they, there was a hysterically funny historiography about this because it was all over the place because nobody, well, nobody had really seen the documents. Um, so it was very, it was very inexpensive actually. Um, it was, um, I think it was like a hundred, it was like 150 pesos, um, not that much. If you wanted to be legitimated, you had to pay about eight or nine times more. So it was, um, it was one of the least expensive favors. And that it was that way because the sums that those um, Panamanian notaries had been asked to pay even before 1795, those were the sums that they put in the 1795 iron uh, cell, the price list. So there's nothing, um, uh, the Crown made no money on this. It, it, it cost them money, given the thousands of pages of, you know, back and forth about all of this that they were having to do. Um, they made no money on this at all. I'm curious, you talked um, <clears throat> about the Venezuelan case and the, the elites in Venezuela uh, were particularly hostile to uh, Costa Mobility. Um, were there regional patterns to elite uh, opposition to Costa Mobility? Were there areas where elites were more favorable to that? Yes, the, the worst part, the worst places were Caracas and, and Cuba. Um, and um, the easiest, the, the places with the greatest mobility were Panama. And, uh, but there are also a, a, a great deal of mobility, just like I said, those Mexican delegates to the Cortes of Cadiz were saying, yeah, this can, it's okay by us for, you know, they let them become citizens. Um, and in one case, in fact, I didn't, I don't know, can you still see the, um, is the PowerPoint still up? Yes, it is. Because I missed something, oh, him. This is the only person I know who um, I have a picture of who, who got one of these, um, Jose Manuel Valdez, who is uh, from Lima. And he um, he was actually a, a, a part of, but he also had some in, in, in Indian blood as well. He was born really, really poor. The man was obviously brilliant. Um, and he became a, the kind of a surgeon that Pardos could become, but every the, he he had a, a mentor who was a white doctor, and he said, "This guy's you know we have to do more for this guy." And actually, the viceroy of Lima applies to the Council of the Indies to whiten him so that he can graduate from the university and become a full fledged doctor. And they uh, apply for him, including with the head of the the the, the highest of, of official in um, Lima applies for him, and he. Um, he becomes he becomes um, he becomes officially white. They immediately graduate him from the university, and by the end of his career, he is the chief medical officer in Lima. Hmm. Wow! So uh, he was someone, and so here here the Lima the, the 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 Lima elites supported his whiteness and were very you know positive toward it. So I really. <clears throat> Another question, what constituted full whiteness? So be granted full whiteness. What did that mean, practically speaking? That meant everything. That meant marriage with whites. That meant ability to hold public office. That meant being able to become a priest. That meant, that meant graduation from the university. If you were white, you could go to the, you, you know, you, you could go to the university. It meant, um, the only thing it didn't mean was that you weren't a noble. 
And sometimes if you had the Basque were nobles and some of them had special privileges that were above regular people's privileges, you didn't have those, like maybe not paying taxes. But other than that, you were equal. You were considered equal. <clears throat> I wanted to um, follow up to my own question a minute ago. <clears throat> um, so that do you, do you have any explanation for the pattern of the sort of variable pattern of elite support or opposition to cost of mobility? Um, yeah, I, I Caracas, I have a special chapter on Venezuela because it was just a very different place. Um, there are the, you had very ingrained inbred elites and you had one of the most prosperous and growing Pardo populations in the Americas. And I think that was, so they were determined to keep the Pardos down, even though- So perceived threat. Really? Yeah, they were seen as a threat. Yeah. Um, elsewhere, not, you know, as you see in Lima, no. And in fact, one of the other Pardos who got whiteness and then um, actually one of the, it, it a wonderful a, a, a Pardo from um, he, his, his family was from Panama, but his father sent him to Bogota and they let him, he got white, he became white, so he was able to graduate from the university, he became a lawyer. And he then eventually for years went to Lima. And I think he probably knew Jose Manuel Valdez because they were together at the same time, Jose Pansion Ayarza. He became one of the first members of Lima's Supreme Court. And he was a part of, but he was, he was, he had been whitened and they accepted him as a Supreme Court justice. So. So, so, and, and, and in Mexico too, I'm, I'm, the place that was most Acuna Matadi-ish was absolutely Panama. You know, there was real upper mobility because it wasn't as the places people wanted to leave. But I would say, you know, um, Lima was, was pretty, pretty good. And, and, and parts of Mexico were, were good as well. I mean, it really, what stands out is, is how Caracas is so far off the chart the other way, and also Havana, especially once the sugar comes in after, this, after the British leave and, and they're really establishing those sugar plantations. And then they're sort of reintroducing slavery and really bringing a new, mm. new cohorts of slaves. Then it gets you know, very uh, prejudicial there as well. But there were there were some Cubans um, who applied. I have, a, I have a question cycling back to um, your comment about Casta paintings. <clears throat> um, that's the main way in which I've interacted personally with uh, the Casta <clears throat> construct in the colonial period. I'm not a colonial uh, historian or even a, a I don't really focus on colonial era <clears throat> Latin America. I'm, I'm more focused on visual cultures. And so the Costa paintings have always struck me as, as fascinating. Um, my understanding is, is that the Costa paintings really are a Mexico phenomena. Um, There's one set for Peru. Is there? Okay. <clears throat> um, but you know, a very uh, circumscribed uh, cultural phenomenon that interacts, uh, you know, as you noted, in a uh, somewhat limited way with the Costa phenomenon as a legal construct, right? Um, <clears throat> and I'm wondering uh, what your understanding of the, the Costa paintings are as a kind of a, a cultural feature of this period in, in um, Latin American colonial history where um, Costas are circulating as an image, right? As a um, an apparent system of classification of different kinds of human beings um, among elites primarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's been, I, and I have a little bit in the book about this, so Joanne Rappaport's one of the people who writes about this and some Mexican historians as well. Um, more and more those, the Casa paintings are sort of seen as sort of elite representations of um, to trying to provide a kind of a, a, an order, but not much of a reflection of what was going on on the ground or in the reality. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of those Costa designations are sort of never used uh, except in Costa paintings. Um, you know, there, you know, you have those long lists of the different those you know crazy names up in the air and down in the tent and all the all the different ones. Um, it, it, people hardly ever, you know, use those. The once in a while there were 
play, different places where one or two different terms like Peru might talk about it differently than they did in Guatemala. But to use that, those long, all those words, it's, it's more seen now as, as sort of elites and also even elites sending the Costa paintings back to Spain saying, you know, right. this, this is our- um, Almost a tourism phenomenon in a way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Not a, not, it, they're not seen so much as a, a thing of reality. now. The the one thing, um, and I guess was it um, Rappaport and all are saying, uh, well, that means that they're also some of them are trying to argue. Well, that means that people on the ground were not sort of doing that kind of math, saying, you know, oh well, I'm one fourth this and one fifth that, therefore I am this. There, I think they go too far because, I mean, I have run across in, in a lot of the, in, in fact, you in some of the cases that I have, you know, you'll have somebody, somebody like one Guatemala saying, well, my grandfather was this and my mother was this and this was this, so I'm one sixth this and one fourth that. And, the, and, and you do find places and documents where people will do that kind of math. So they, they were aware of kinds of mixing and, and who their grandfather was, was, and they could do the math about that. And some of them did, but they didn't have all those names. They would just say, I'm one fifth Pardo, or I, I, I got one, you know, third Indian or you know, something like that. They were, they were aware of those things. And, and they, 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 they provided math on it um, sometimes when they were petitioning um, and saying, I've moved this far toward whiteness now. Um, because if they got below one eighth, they were, they were considered white anyway. Um, so we have another question in the Q and A. When was color considered accidental? Yeah, color is really tough, and it is so hard to, especially when you're Anglo reading these documents, to get into how people at the time are using those words. Um, this whole, and that's why I spend some time talking about that naturaleza thing, which is so alien to us. Um, but that was how, I mean, that's how royal officials would do it. And they're like, there's a wonderful case that I talk about in the book where at one point um, they're deciding on taxes and they're trying, they're trying to decide um, how to, uh, how, how, whether, whether, you know, partos and mulattoes should, what, what they should pay. And some of the Pardos and Mulattoes are saying, well, we're white, you know, so we'll pay the white taxes, we pay the Alcabala, or if we're, we're Pardos, we have to pay the tribute. And a lot of Pardos would prefer to pay the white taxes because that made them more close to whites. Um, and so royal officials had some of these people that they were trying to decide whether they should tell them to, what kind of taxes to tell them to pay. And they said, we don't know how to do this because we don't know their natural laces. These people, we don't know who their parents are, they're orphans. And so we don't know who, whether, you know, if their parents were, were pardos and so they should pay the, pay the tribute or whether if their parents were white or they should pay the Alcabala. And we can't tell by, by, by their parents because you can't tell by that. You have to know who their parents were and what they inherited from their parents. And so in that case, and, and there's a wonderful document on this, they said, well, okay, then, We'll just let them decide what kind of tax they want to pay because we can't tell them. We can't figure that out. And they refused to, to decide how, how what tax people should pay by what they look like. They said, that's that's not how we decide this. It's their natural laces. So they took that really seriously. It's hard for us to take seriously, but they they seemed to they did take it seriously. And that was why this could happen. Now, another thing though you think about is, I mean, this is obviously totally against what would be an Anglo vision of this issue that, you know, everybody should be equal. Pardos and mulattoes were not arguing. Pardos and mulattoes agreed that being white was superior. They were just saying, we want to be white. That's our, that's our, that's our sort of um, solution to this is not to, to make every, all pardos and mulattoes equal to whites. It's for some of us to become white. So, we have, we have time for one more question. If uh, anyone else would like to, oh, uh, here we go. <clears throat> um, could Indians purchase the right of being white? Um, they didn't have to um, uh, because they had lymphase de sangre. And if you had lymphase de sangre or clean blood, you had all the privileges of whiteness. So in that sense, they didn't have to. Now, Indians, could and did sometimes 
you know, they did the same kind of math that um, Pars and Mulattoes might be, you know, my grandfather was this and my mother was that and my mother was this and my father was that and therefore I am that percentage. You, you see some of that going on, although much more in African descended populations than in native populations. But they were technically considered, they, they were considered white, they, they, they were considered to have Lumpia City Sangre so that they could, um, uh, they didn't, uh, they, they, technically they were not forbidden um, to attend universities or do any of these things. They were, they had Lumpia City Sangre. Interesting. <clears throat> I mean, when you think of the big thing, the thing I always think about is in the Cortes of Cadiz, these, 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 the, the India, the American delegates sort of, I think sort of hoodwinking the Spanish saying, hey, you know, you got to make all the natives and us, you know, we are, we've got to have the vote right away. Um, and in some ways, in many ways, many of the Pardos and Mulattoes are far more in, incorporated into the society than some of the native populations were who didn't speak Spanish and were living in their native you know, territories. They were not so much into what the Cortes of Cadiz was doing. Well, actually some of the Pardos and Mulattoes really were. Um, it's sort of an interesting, you know, I think that, the, I don't, well, I think, I know reading the, the documents that the Spanish, the Spanish representatives had no idea what the Americans was like. They really didn't know. Well, this has been this has been fascinating. <clears throat> I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Twynum, for sharing your work with us um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, spending the time to, to respond to questions <clears throat> um, in conversation with us as well. Um, and. Uh, um, can't thank you enough for so your willingness fun. to participate. <clears throat> I know these circumstances are odd, uh, and they are for all of us. <clears throat> um, but uh, this is this has been uh, very interesting, um, and I think useful for all of us in different ways to reflect on <clears throat> um, uh, the history of race um, and uh, and racism um, through this particular <clears throat> uh, vantage in history. Um, yeah, it really shocked me when I did the research. I hadn't expected to find this at all. Yeah. So, so, so thank you again. I want to thank you all for um, those of us in our, our audience for uh, <clears throat> joining us this evening. I hope you all will uh, join us again next semester. The Latino Latin American Studies faculty will be organizing a, um, a, an event series, probably also on webinar <clears throat> uh, format on the theme of anti-racism in the Americas. So to some degree, uh, an extension of our uh, theme this semester. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Twynum, and thank you all for attending. Have Enjoy. a very nice evening. Good night. Good night. Okay, we'll see. I, what do I do? Meeting. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, and, um, excuse me, uh, Mary Niedenfuhrer will be in touch with you with uh, some forums and stuff. Sure, okay. no biggie, no biggie. Well, have a good night. You too, take care. Thank you okay. again.